Betamax. <laughs> There's a word you don't hear often. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back to Dubious Engineering. Today we're going to have a look at this Betamax. It's on the operating table. It's got problems. We're going to pull it apart and we're going to fix it. But before we do that, let's have a quick talk about the history of Betamax versus VHS. 1975 saw the birth of Sony's Betamax. This was followed by the competing VHS format from JVC in around 1976, almost a year later. Subsequently, the Betamax VHS format wars began. While VHS's machine's lower rental price was a major factor, the principal battleground provided to be recording time. The original Sony Betamax video recorder could record for only 60 minutes, whereas JVC's VHS could manage 120 minutes, shortly followed by RCA's American entrance into the market with a 240-minute recorder, again using VHS. When home VCRs started to become popular in the UK, the main issue was one of availability and price. VHS machines were available through the high street rental chains such as Radio Rentals, whilst Beta was seen as the more upmarket choice for people who wanted quality and were prepared to pay for it. By 1980, out of an estimated 100,000 homes with VCRs in England, 70% were rented, since a lot of money, nearly £2,000, could be spent on a system that might become obsolete. The main determining factor between Betamax and VHS format was the cost of the recorders and recording time. Betamax is a superior recording format over VHS due to resolution, 250 lines versus 240 lines, slightly superior sound and a more stable image. Betamax recorders were also of higher quality construction. However, these differences were negligible to consumers and thus didn't really justify either the extra cost of a Betamax VCR or Betamax's shorter recording time. The VHS technology was licensed to any manufacturer that was interested. Manufacturers then competed against each other for sales, resulting in lower prices to the consumer. Sony was the only manufacturer of Betamax and so was not pressured to reduce their prices. Only in 1980s did Sony decide to license Betamax to other manufacturers such as Toshiba and Sanyo. By the time Sony made these changes to their strategy, VHS had already dominated the market, with Betamax relegated to a niche position. Beta sales dwindled away and VHS emerged as the winner of the format war. By 1988, beta format was officially declared dead without any more new models being released. Sony then began to assemble and market VHS machines. Sony also had good successes with VHS by the mid-1990s. It was quite clear that the beta format was dead, at least in Europe and North America. Who's a clever little Sony then? I am. Let's have a look around this lovely Sony Betamax recorder and player. Made in Japan, the Sony SL-HF100UB was one of only two high-fidelity sound Betamax recorders released by Sony in the UK domestic market. Cosmetically, it's a stylish looking front-loading machine. It has all the timer and play controls of a typical video recorder. The extra functions of the unit are some sliders for setting the audio levels. What made this unit special was its audio quality, as can be seen by the massive blue sticker on the top of it, comparing Betamax Hi-Fi to other systems such as open reel tape recorders and FM radio. The TV tuning controls are under a panel on the top of the unit. These offer a test signal and auto-tune functionality. On the rear of the unit, a radio frequency gain switch marked as DX Local is present next to the TV aerial connectors. There are connectors for video in and video out and stereo audio in and out. A Sony specific camera remote connector and a 6 pin DIN AV connector are there for remote control and signal transfers. Also a separate power switch to turn the unit on. Let's see what happens when we power this unit up and try to put a tape in.
In goes the tape. No, it doesn't. So it's quite clear that the unit thinks that the tape is already loaded in the system. When we take the lid off and we have a look inside, there's clearly no tape. And one of the cogs is literally just spinning. So let's check out some of the electronics and make sure that it's not some kind of a fundamental sensor failure or logic function error. So no problems detected with the sensors, but trying to eject the tape, again, nothing. The cog just spins and the light flashes. So I thought it would be good fun to have a go and see if we can test out some of the mechanics by hand. And sure enough, the mechanics for the tape loading and ejecting mechanism seem to work quite well. But one thing that is quite clear to me, the machine is not lacing the tape. So let's get into the machine a little bit more. Let's disassemble Johnny 5 here and start having a look around. And the first thing I wanted to do was have a look at that spinning gear. And on further inspection, I noticed that this little tiny cog had a tiny, tiny little micro crack in it. It was very difficult to detect that by eye. It was quite clear once I pulled the mechanism out and the cog fell off that actually there was indeed a problem. So what I did is I went ahead and I used some epoxy glue to repair that cog and stick it back on to the shaft. Next part of the deal was trying to reassemble everything once I pulled it all apart. Remembering how everything goes and the position of everything is always quite good fun. So I took lots of pictures before I did this and actually making a video helps as well. You've got something to refer back to. So once that was all reassembled, it was time to test the mechanism by hand and then it was time to start putting in all of the other parts of the mechanism and reassembling Johnny 5. Once that was done, it was time to power the unit on to see what happened. And amazingly, that tape lacing mechanism that wraps the tape around the playhead worked. And then, fitting a tape into the unit, the tape automatically got sucked in and the tape was then laced around the playhead. I was quite ecstatic at this point. And one thing that I did notice, that one of the lacing bars that bends underneath the mechanism had been bent. Anyway, let's watch that again, because it was quite a satisfying moment in the repair of this unit. Once we got the tape in, and the tape had laced automatically around the playhead, it was time to have a go and see if the machine would actually play. And lo and behold, it looked like it was working. So, what's next? <laughs> time to watch a video. Great news, this thing is all fixed up and ready to go back to its owner. Ed, I hope you really enjoy it and appreciate it for what it is. I know you will because I know you love watching your old Betamax tape collection from time to time. As always, thanks ever so much for watching guys and girls. Take care. Make sure you give us a good old thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. And we'll see you in the next video. Cheers and beers, people. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye for now.